We're the Anunnaki, the sons of God of Genesis 6, and are we the sons of God today? Now, the Anunnaki are famous, you know, as the ancient Sumerian gods from numerous ancient alien TV shows. The sons of God, Genesis 6, are only celebrated by students of the Bible, but they're found in one of the most controversial passages in all of Scripture. But here's the million-dollar question. Are they the same beings? Let's look at their respective names. In Hebrew, the phrase is B'nai Ha Elohim, literally sons of Elohim. It's a phrase used in the Old Testament and in Christian Apocrypha, Elohim, of course, being the name of God in the book of Genesis. The phrase Anunnaki means seed of Anu or offspring of Anu. Anu was the supreme god in Sumerian mythology. So the terms Anunnaki, offspring of Anu, and sons of God are parallel phrases, both meaning children of the supreme god or creations of the supreme god. So, if these two groups are the same, just like the phrases that describe them, then we can look at the Sumerian legends for approximations of what the B'nai Ha Elohim, or sons of God, did while they're on earth because we aren't told a whole lot in the Bible. Much like the non-canonical Hebrew book of Enoch gives us approximations of their actions. So this is a pretty big question. Also, since the New Testament tells Christians that we will be future tense, called sons of God, understanding exactly what that phrase means has very important meaning for us as well. But before we answer earth-shaking questions like that, there's a lot of confusion about who the sons of God are in Genesis 6. I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, hey, hey, wait a minute. My church taught me that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were children of Seth, not divine beings of some sort. Because those sons of God end up having children with human women. And if they're heavenly beings, well, that's just gross, disgusting, and way too supernatural for my church. These churches dare channels like mine to find answers to that question using only the Bible. Don't use the book of Enoch or heaven forbid the Sumerian myths, they say. I believe the answer to that question is found in the Bible and we don't need to look for it anywhere else. This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters. And those who follow this channel know we aren't afraid to tackle difficult questions about Bible prophecy. We do it all the time. If you like how we handle this one, subscribe to the channel to get three other teachings like this every week. There are six references to these beings in the Old Testament. Two are in Genesis chapter 6, and three are found in the book of Job and one in Deuteronomy. Let's start by looking at the verses in question in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, because this is the passage that has an interesting statement about the sons of God taking wives from the daughter of men. Now, it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This is the controversial part, because marriage and procreation are definitely taking place here. One theory is that the sons of God were humans either the sons of Seth or maybe kings back before the flood, and that they married, quote, evil women from the line of Cain. This theory came from church fathers such as Origen and Augustine from 300 to 400 years after Jesus' resurrection. If your church teaches this theory, then Augustine is where they got this idea. Origen and Augustine are also responsible for other theories, like replacement theology, and a great deal of the anti-Semitism in the church. Plus, they are the first to spawn the end-time ideas of preterism and amillennialism. In contrast to these church fathers from 300 AD on, the church's apostolic church fathers, like Irenaeus and Hippolytus, who studied under those who were taught directly by the apostles, taught that the sons of God were fallen divine beings or angels. So around 3 to 400 AD, with the emergence of the Catholic Church, that's when people stopped believing that the sons of God were heavenly creatures. However, I want to set aside both theories and just look at what the Bible says about who the sons of God are. In the book of Job 38, 4-7, God asks Job some rhetorical questions that Job can't answer. 
just to show him that Job doesn't know or understand things the way that God does. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So God himself tells us that when he created the world, the sons of God were already there and they shouted for joy. That pretty much eliminates these possibilities that this class of being was a human. Obviously, there were no humans alive at the creation. This phrase in Job 38 could have just as easily been aimed at Origen and Augustine, God saying, where were you when I created the world to question what the word makes so clear? Although the Catholic Church calls Augustine a saint, St. Augustine was responsible for horrible misunderstandings of proper doctrine, things like replacement theology and anti-Semitism, which in World War II Germany were largely responsible for the Holocaust. So maybe Augustine wasn't a saint, but rather, maybe... He was a heretic. It certainly led Christians to many dangerous beliefs and which still lead people astray today. In the book of Job, there are two more passages about the sons of God. In both passages, the B'nai Ha Elohim present themselves before God in heaven along with Satan. Again, this is not referring to the sons of Seth or earthly kings, but maybe to heavenly kings. In Deuteronomy 32.8, We learn that after the Tower of Babel incident, when God divided the nations, he gave their administration to these sons of God. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples or nations according to the number of the sons of God. This is the SV translation. Your Bible may say that God fixed the borders according to the number of the sons of Israel, not the sons of God. First of all, think. Think about that. It just makes zero sense because Israel did not exist for another couple hundred years at that point. So there were no sons of Israel. In addition, the reason the ESV and several other translations have changed their wording to the sons of God is that is what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Deuteronomy and also in the Septuagint. Both the Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagint date back from before the time of Jesus. The earliest Masoretic text, where the Sons of Israel idea came from, was 1,200 years more recent. The ESV translators believe the Sons of Israel line was just a scribal error from what the original Old Testament Deuteronomy of the Dead Sea Scrolls said, and I agree 100%. So this is at least consistent with what the Anunnaki, or Seed of Anu, were as well. So we know a son of God is a divine being, but not God's physical son. Here is what Jesus says in the New Testament about how we will become sons of God. For they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Jesus says the sons of God are that because they're sons of the resurrection, because they've been resurrected. Paul in Romans 8.23 has the very self-same thing to say. And not only this, but we also, ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Our change into resurrection bodies is going to mark our adoption as sons of God. We aren't sons of God right now, but the Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we will become them. This brings us back to the Anunnaki, the seed of Anu, according to the Sumerian myths. This means they were likely then also immortal. The second thing we learned about the sons of God in Genesis 6 is that they had children with human women. Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore them children. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So not only did they have children with the women, but these kids were men of renown, or people who became famous. What about the Anunnaki in their myths? Did they have famous children with humans? Absolutely. One of the most famous characters of ancient Sumer was this guy named Gilgamesh. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's the oldest written heroic poem in history. I think it's like 1,500 years older than the Iliad and the Odyssey. Interesting stuff. So Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk. 
one of the Sumerian city-states, and he's said to be two-thirds God and one-third human in that epic poem. Now, although this is only mythology, it does fit with the idea that the children of the Anunnaki were hybrid, half-God, half-human, and also men of renown, because Gilgamesh was a very famous king. I'm sure this also sounds similar to some of the other pagan stories like Egyptian, Babylonian, Greek about the demigods, the offspring of the gods mating with humans. It's possible that the pagan stories came from the same events that were described in Genesis. It's absolutely possible. Now, the Anunnaki were thought to possess extraordinary powers and were often envisioned as being of tremendous physical size. The deities typically wore something called melam, an Im- kind of ambiguous substance which covered them in terrifying splendor. The effect of seeing a deity's melam on a human is described as causing a tingling of the flesh. Interestingly, angels in the Bible are often said to shine or be bright and cause great fear. Is this the same thing that the Sumerians saw? The Anunnaki were almost always depicted wearing horned caps also. It's interesting that in the book of Revelation, Satan and the beast each have ten horns, and the false prophet has two horns. Is this also similar to the Anunnaki and the sons of God? The Anunnaki also formed a ruling council. Kings like Gilgamesh ruled the earth, but the ruling council of Anunnaki oversaw what guys like Gilgamesh did. This matches the biblical narrative as well. In Daniel 4, we see Daniel interpreting a dream of earthly king Nebuchadnezzar of a great tree. At the decree of the council of the watchers, Nebuchadnezzar is punished by being reduced to a beast for seven years to humble him. The watchers are another name for the sons of God. In 1 Kings 22.19, the prophet Micaiah has a vision that God is seated among a council of his angels, and he asks who will go for him to influence King Ahab. Again, influencing an earthly king. And most strikingly, in Psalm 82, God sits in a council whom he calls gods and discusses why he's going to judge and punish them. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Psalm 82, 1-2. So the Anunnaki and the sons of God in the Bible both are part of a divine council. And finally, there are the individual Anunnaki, some of whom we believe show up in the Bible, especially this character Enlil. He was the oldest of the Anunnaki, the god of the air, and chief god of the Sumerians. The Sumerians believed that until Enlil was born, heaven and earth were inseparable, kind of like back in the Garden of Eden. Then Enlil split heaven and earth in two and carried away the earth for himself, while his father, Anu, carried away the sky. Well, who does that sound like? (laughs) It sounds like Satan, right? Indeed. Click right here to keep watching and discover where in the Bible Satan is actually referred to by this name, Enlil, and all the other ways that this character is like Satan. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.